morning to everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be up with the birds. This is the Africa FinTech Summit. I'm very excited to have this conference despite everything that is keeping us apart. This has been a wonderful year so far for the organization and I'm excited to be the chair of the conference this year. And this presents us with an opportunity this morning to really give um, a great robust conversation around the fintech sector for Africa. My colleagues and the rest of the team led by Leyland have put together a great lineup. And if you haven't already listened to the preamble before this, you'll know that this is a three day occasion with a gap on the 11th for Veterans Day. But I don't want to take up any more valuable time because we have some wonderful keynote speakers this morning. And it's my pleasure to kick it off by introducing our, ne our first speaker of the day, Admasu Pedesh, who is the CEO of the Trade and Development Bank, that is the, the East and the South region of that. And I was reading through his background in anticipation of this morning and was struck and excited to hear what he had to say. Coming from a large corporate uh, oversight background and operations that he runs at the Trade and Development Bank, he also has brought an entrepreneurial sensibility that has allowed the TDB to move from a greater expansion plans to the point that their assets have grown from 1 billion to 6.7 billion. And as you know, in this digital age, it takes a lot of moving pieces to cross that digital divide. And for him to be recognized, it's the 2019 Banker of the Year. Congratulations on that. I know that you will bring some wonderful insights to today's conversation. He's also a graduate of the London School of Economics Harvard Business School and Western University. And I have to say, he's one of the giants of our continent as it relates to digital transformation. I hope that you can hear us this morning. Admasu, wave if you can. Can't quite hear you, I'm afraid. Can you hear us? Good morning. I think you are on mute. Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. yes, we can hear you now. That's what we've been waiting for. Welcome to the conference. Excited to have you. And I'm going to hand it over to you um, to kick off your keynote. Have a great session uh, to you and to everybody else listening out there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. And good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Greetings wherever you may be. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Leland Rice, Akari Amsalu, and others for inviting uh, TDB, myself, to share a perspective on this uh, occasion of the, I think it's the second Africa FinTech Summit. Of course, we, we always like uh, to engage on this exciting topic of FinTech. As we all know, a very dynamic phenomena that's been transforming the economic and financial landscape of the world particularly parts of our developing world. And in fact, it is a topic that's very close to our hearts at TDB, because we have seen at TDB how FinTech innovations have increasingly supported economic growth and poverty reduction as well through the financial development we've seen in the sector, inclusion and also efficiency. We've been quite amazed actually to see how the fusion of technology and finance has enabled all these breathtaking advancements in how we do banking and how financial services are accessed and transacted. The, the industry, of course, has fast overcome physical and distance barriers and is continually reaping these new efficiencies that we're all excited about through technology-enabled ways involving storage, processing, accessing, and of course, exchanging financial information. We have, of course, witnessed how this has paved the way for new business models that have been mushrooming on the back of revolutionary applications, processes, and products as well. Several names come to mind when we think of revolutionary, Amazon Pay, Alipay, Apple Pay. Cryptocurrencies have been in fashion for quite some time. And nowadays, of course, we have wallets and the like all very exciting. 
coming more closely to my particular industry of banking, we've seen how structural networks of commercial banking have been reconfigured by digital banking, making costly phys physical bank branches less and less relevant and promising to reduce the cost to serve. For banks, cost to income is always a key performance ratio. It's always a struggle to bring down those costs for branches. I'm addressing you today from our TDB offices here in Nairobi, Kenya, which as many of you will know is the pioneering hometown of the world-renowned M-Pesa, a global leader and a first in the mobile money phenomena that started some 14 years ago. And of course, it's gone far beyond Kenya and it's taken the region by storm. I'm going to show a couple of slides as I talk through the, the subject. And uh, just bear with me as I switch on the full screen. And this is just to remind you how far mobile money transactions have come over the years. And you can see how in, in our part of Africa, we have several countries that have actually caught up to Kenya. You have Tanzania there as the, the largest peak at the moment. Of course, it moves back and forth, but you have the top tier countries, Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, all East African economies that have moved very aggressively with mobile money transactions. You can see the volumes per 100,000 adults there on the, on the graph. We uh, have also seen, of course, how relative to the rest of the world, this continues to be a leading region. Uh, I didn't actually mention it goes way beyond Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. You have also Ghana there in the, in the, high, in the high countries on the, on the histogram. Uh, of course, you have Zimbabwe as well. And these are countries that five years ago weren't so high up. So there's just always tremendous movement and development. But you can just see from this graph as well how the, the region continues to be a leader worldwide. Whether you look at accounts per thousand adults, or you look at the number of outlets per hundred thousand adults, or whether you look at transactions as a percentage of GDP. So really it's continued to be a, a leading region in the world in terms of this particular innovation. And of course, for many uh, who tend to think that it's all remittance driven, it's not. There are several other applications that are being used quite intensively. Payment of utility bills, as you can see, receipt of wages, uh, also payments being made for agricultural projects, products, and also payment of school fees. So there's a whole wide range of usage of of mobile money applications in our region. And it's been quite a success as we all know. And, and of course, this has driven a uh, very deep interest by development financiers and impact investors, given the widespread impact, both commercial and development impact. Particularly in the impact space, access to finance and inclusion has been quite profound, particularly for rural dwellers, youth, and especially women who in a number of countries face serious cultural distance and safety impediments to visit proper bank branches. So mobile money and mobile banking has made a huge difference to these communities that are not able to readily access conventional banking outlets. Of course, on the back of the very fast growth we've seen in ICT infrastructure over the many years, past since the millennium actually came around, FinTech has helped to reduce not only physical barriers, but also documentation barriers in a context where some half a billion of us Africans actually lack any form of government recognized identification. We know how electronic recording and storage of ID related documents on servers of governments and corporates has become quite instrumental in easing the opening and processing of transaction accounts with vital information digitally available for KYC and the authentication of transactions. Beyond, of course, Africa, other developing regions like India have made huge strides as well. We've seen them introduce biometric based digital ID systems, which is now enabling efficiencies to over a billion people. 
it's been really fascinating to see how such applications have been generating new synergies as we see unusually how governments, businesses, and developers are interacting efficiently with one another on a paperless and cashless basis. The growing application of fintech has certainly brought about a wealth of useful experience on how even simple technologies can aid large-scale financial inclusion and development. Of course, we're all very excited about all the progress that we've seen over the past 10, 15 years. But of course, there still remain gaps. Access is very far from universal, and there are gaps and challenges that remain. Of course, one of the biggest ones remains physical infrastructure gaps, as you can see on the slide before you. Foundational infrastructure in the ICT space, such as telecoms, broadnet, broad, broadband internet, mobile data ser services, and data repositories, these are the kinds of physical infrastructure elements that are very key and that still need to be developed and rolled out. An example of how this continues to be a challenge can be seen in the next slide. And you can see how in Sub-Saharan Africa, fixed broadband subscriptions per 100 people is just one. That's 1% compared to other low and middle income countries where you have 9%, which is still low, and of course, when you move to the high income space, it's 31. So it's a factor of almost 30 between the high income countries and, and sub-Saharan Africa. So this is really a clarification of, of, of how much infrastructure still remains to be developed. And of course, broadband is a key, key part of the ICT infrastructure that will be the backbone for so much more FinTech going forward. Of course, we also have the, the mobile data connection and there you can see Africa has done much better, 73 uh, per 100 people, 73 subscriptions per 100 people. And that compares, of course, uh, not as badly as in the case of broadband, but still quite significantly behind low and middle income countries. And of course, way behind high income countries, which is to be expected. But this is just to confirm that there's still quite a bit that needs to be done in, in terms of rolling out ICT infrastructure. I think it should be pointed out that the infrastructure gap is not just the ICT space, it is very much the power space as well. We know that all ICT generally depends on power. And, and of course, the power picture is, is also uh, very reflective of the gaps. And now we, 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 we're much more excited about the prospects ahead, but the average rate of access to electricity today is about 43%, which is half the global rate of 87%. So there's still a great deal of catching up. I guess the good news here is that there's been a very strong focus in the past five to 10 years on closing this infrastructure power gap. And I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with several critical initiatives, including the African Union's Agenda 2063, the US-led Power Africa Initiative, and the African Development Bank's Light Up Africa strategic thrust. These are all key, key, key thrusts to push this issue of closing the gap of, of power infrastructure. Some of you may recall how at the beginning of this millennium, Africa had a very, very uh, big gap in the ICT space, but yet we, we managed to leapfrog very, uh, in a very special way over the past 20 years to the point where we've come today to where we are. And of course, that success with ICT expansion of infrastructure was built on the back of reforms. And I think what's really exciting these days on the power side is that we're beginning to see very uh, aggressive reforms, liberalization, specifically coming to the power sector on the generation side, which should see large scale private sector investments through PPPs, complementing public sector investments to boost the generation of power in the region. We've seen uh, also a lot of this new power that is being planned and some of the big ones that have come online in the past few years are of a renewable nature. Those of you who know the power sector in Kenya will know of the story of uh, Turkana wind, which is a 300 megawatt uh, uh, wind power generation plant that's been uh, the biggest on the continent. It's been a very exciting, form of renewable energy. It's really made a huge difference here in Kenya. 
And there's many others around the region uh, that are also becoming uh, closer to, to fruition. And so the whole area of power, of course, is a very important part of the physical infrastructure gap. But I think, I think it's important to point out that infrastructure uh, has many faces and the institutional realm is another dimension. So we know that in this world of fintech, there is this very critical area of institutional infrastructure comprising issues like regulation, policy, uh, legal frameworks, covering a number of issues such as competition, user rights, and of course, the integrity of financial systems. We do know, of course, that as imperfect as regulatory frameworks are, they are necessary for the orderly development and stability of the financial system and the safe entry of new products and intermediaries as well. Trust and confidence, very important, has to be something that's there to safeguard the integrity of financial systems. We all know that we cannot ignore the risks of criminal misuse of fintech, including money laundering and the financing of terrorism, which we as banks are always reminded that we have to be vigilant about. While we know that the innovations in fintech are generally legitimate, we do know that there's quite a few users who do sometimes evade controls for non-honorable ends, posing a threat, of course, to financial integrity. So there is need for regulation, of course, and policy frameworks to support that. On the legal side, of course, it's very important also to modernize the legal codes and the framework in general to ensure that there is an enabling legal landscape with adequate legal clarity around activities in fintech, especially around practices and e-commerce. In the past six months, we have seen how important this legal framework modernization is. We have, of course, suffered from lockdowns and partial lockdowns. It's been very difficult to move around and conduct business conventionally. We've had to move towards e-commerce models in ways that we never really had to. And of course, it helps a great deal when you have frameworks that actually allow you to do that kind of business remotely, to do electronic signatures and the like. But of course, it's not, it's not been as straightforward as we would have liked to, because not all countries recognize the full range of, of activities that, that, that need to uh, be uh, legitimized in the con context of, of e-commerce. Of course, there are other sensitive issues that also need to be looked at closely as um, institutional infrastructure is developed further. We know that cybersecurity is a very topical issue, data ownership, consumer protection. So of course, the institutional framework around the continent will have to continue to, to develop. And, and it's not going to be so easy in all countries because some countries are far ahead, countries like South Africa, to some extent, Kenya, Egypt, Morocco, these are the countries, and I think Nigeria as well, are the ones that have gone quite a distance on institutional frameworks to support e-commerce and, of course, uh, fintech as well. But there is need for uh, perhaps regional institutions and pan-African bodies to step in and create perhaps uh, more generic frameworks that uh, can go um, to be adopted across borders quite easily. And of course, it's, it's always important to limit risks that arise from divergence in regulatory frameworks across borders, because a lot of cross-border business, of course, requires uh, frameworks that are, that are understood on both sides and have legitimacy on both sides. Uh, just a few words on our experience as TDB with FinTech and our support to the FinTech ecosystem. We have adopted financial technology here internally at the bank. And we've discovered firsthand the power it has to transform how we deliver and transact in this financial services world of ours. Of course, there's the ordinary adoption of internal automation, e-payment solutions and the like, but we've gone beyond that to start adopting more cutting edge technologies in the area of trade finance, specifically using blockchain technology in a way that we never have in the past. In fact, last year in 2019, we were amongst the very first specialist banks of our nature to conduct the first live end-to-end -end trade finance transaction. And we have continued with speed on that because when Corona-19 came in, we discovered that 
conventional ways of doing business were actually getting very uh, lethargic and difficult to do in good time. And so we started to scale up and to, to do more blockchain based trade finance business. And it's actually taken us uh, much further than we had expected uh, from last year. So we've done in the past 12 to 18 months over $100 million of trade finance business involving a total of about 350,000 metric tons of agricultural and agricultural input commodities, trade finance transactions between Ethiopia and Morocco in intra-African trade, which is of course the priority these days, but also between Ethiopia and India who are also trading partners. And, and of course, we've, we've discovered that this innovation in introducing blockchain is reducing our carbon footprint from the typical way in which we do this kind of business. It's reducing cost as well as turnaround time. And at the same time, it's improving transparency and traceability. In one of the $80 million trade deals that we did this year, we succeeded to finalize a transaction in just under two hours when equivalent transactions involving the physical movement of documents typically takes more than three weeks. The time saving that we discovered was actually even more attractive in this COVID disrupted environment because it normally takes now about six weeks to move conventional financing documents around because logistics systems, of course, have slowed down dramatically. Beyond our own internal application of fintech type uh, activities and innovations, we've also been uh, very active outside the bank, investing debt capital in various mobile telecom companies and fiber optic cable companies. Some are regional and they work across several countries like Econet Group, which some of you would know, also includes subsidiaries such as Cassava, SmartTech, and Liquid Telecom, which has built Africa's largest independent fiber optic cable of about 72,000 kilometers across several countries, ranging from Kenya, where we are now, Tanzania, Rwanda, South Africa, Zambia, Botswana, quite, a, quite an amazing African corporate. We've been very happy to support them and we've, uh, we've put almost $100 million into that company in debt financing. Uh, another case, of course, which is a bit smaller than that, of course, is the Burundi Backbone Cable Company which has laid out 1,200 kilometers of fiber optic cable connecting landlocked Burundi to the massive undersea cables on the Eastern seaboard of Africa and the Indian Ocean. And that's been another company that was a startup. It was a greenfield. And, and we were one of the first to actually step up to the challenge and, and put a significant amount of debt capital into that company. And today they're very profitable and quite successful. The power sector, of course, is, is another place, another sector that we've had a great footprint. We've invested in at least 13 different power projects across several countries. And we are associated with helping to generating around 1,300 megawatts of power, mostly from renewable energy sources. So both internally within the bank using FinTech proper, but also on the ecosystem side, externally supporting ICT companies, uh, we've we've been very active indeed. And that is, of course, uh, the same spirit that many of you would have, which is the strong belief that fintech continues to hold a great deal of promise for Africa as well as the world at large. Fulfilling the promise of this far-reaching social and economic impact arising from fintech will no doubt require continued innovation, reforms, and institutional development. And of course, we as investors and financiers need to demonstrate our continued appetite. We at TDB are certainly committed and looking forward to more engagements in the months and years to come. And we look forward to collaborating with FinTech Africa Summit and many of you here in the audience as we all search for better uh, and impactful opportunities ahead. I thank you for your attention. Adma, so thank you so very much. I myself was furiously scribbling notes at the end of your keynote, which is just so perfect for today's um, conference and the rest of it. I know that we will have a wrap up later, but in the interim, I think one of the greatest takeaways from what you shared today was the fact that I realize how much time, cost, 
quality and transparency are cornerstones of the kind of work that TDB is heralding. And it is a great nod to the rest of us who are innovating for the space. So thank you. Um, for the rest of us um, who have had our coffee, thank you for checking in. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. At this point, you will be um, allowed to enter the different panels that are going on right now. And specifically, there are regional panels, West Africa specifically, a fireside chat, and don't forget those exhibits that are there as well. And we'll see you back at the end of today's conference uh, schedule, somewhere close to 1020, 1025 for a wrap up. So thank you so very much. And I'm going to quit the broadcast so that we can allow the rest of the event to take place. Enjoy the rest of the summit.